35,000 is the number of decisions we make every day. I don't have an addiction to devices. Definitely, we've always been persuaded and influenced. Why is it that we have to convince people that they are not rational? If we open a timeline right now, any, any social media, the sequence in which information will appear to us, it's completely outside of our control. Awareness is not sufficient. Knowing the biases will never make us immune, but it can help the consequences. We had the radio on in the background. If the phone goes off, the attention shifts. We have to really be frugal with our attention. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. So my name is Linda Rising. As you can see, I'm incredibly old. I was born in 1942. That means I'm a member of not Gen Z or the millennials, but a member of what was called the silent generation. My family did not have television until I was 10 years old. So I certainly didn't grow up with a computer or a phone. So I don't struggle with the problems that many of you do. I don't have an addiction to devices. I often forget to turn my phone on in the morning and check for any email or phone messages. But what we know about the way the world is headed now, that is a serious problem for increasing numbers of people. So I was really happy to see this book by my good friend, Fabio, and I'm gonna enjoy this discussion that we're gonna to have today. So Fabio, take it away. Hi Linda, what an honor to have you uh, uh, here in this conversation with me about the, the Digital Nudge book. It was, it was amazing to meet you in Copenhagen in 2019 when we were still like, able to hug each other in conferences and hopefully soon we'll be able to do that again. Um, I'm Fabio Pereira. I am the author of the book Digital Nudge. I've been working with technology for, for over 20 years now. I have a computer science degree uh, and I started as a developer back in 2000. I was a Java developer and then it was it was soon in my career when I realized that the digital transformation and the technology revolution that we are going through right now, it's more about humans and behavior than actually technology. So I, I fell in love with something called behavior economics, which is a, it's a recent area of, of research and study on, on human irrationality. And I created this uh, merge between behavior economics and the digital world. And that ended up being um, documented, if you will, in the Digital Nudge book. It's an honor to be here talking to you right now, Linda. So when you say behavioral economics, you want to refer to, of course, the classic Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize, and also the book that's called Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. So there's been an explosion of awareness of the problem that we have, that we are learning more. Behavioral economists are doing experiments that tell us more about how we think, how we make decisions, how we solve problems. And why is that so terrifying for those people who haven't read your book yet? What's the scary thing about behavioral economics what what scared me the most when i started reading the books and you're right it's all those books thinking fast and slow nudge from taylor and sunstein and also predictably rational from dan Ariely, which was actually the first book i i read on the topic and i had the, the huge privilege to meet uh, dan Ariely as well and uh, yeah amazing amazing people thinking about uh, how we make decisions and what scares me the most is the number 35,000, which ironically is the number I'm wearing here on the t-shirt. 35,000 is the number of decisions we make every day. And we tend to think that we are rational, right? I grew up hearing and studying that humans are rational beings. And then I, I bump into this book called Predictably Irrational, 
where we get scientific um, experiments proving that we are irrational and in a predictable way. So that was the thing that scared me the most. And I started making some correlations between when we are being irrational in the digital world. So I'll give you an example. If we go to Google right now and we search for where to eat in New York, we will have over 1 billion results. And Google calculates that in 0.94 seconds. So in less than one second, it gives us 1 billion results. It just turns out that 9 in 10 people click on a result on, a result on the first page of Google of the Google results. So I started realizing that those decisions were not be made by me anymore. I started just having that thought in my mind that I am not in control of my life anymore, that the digital world is controlling me and I am being nudged. And that's when the, the, the digital nudge concept came about, which is I was being nudged all the time in order to make decisions. And I thought I was making those decisions consciously, but I wasn't. And, uh, and that's where what scared me the most. Yeah. I, and I teach a class on thinking fast and slow, and I'm getting ready to do another class on influence by Robert Cialdini. And you're right, Dan Ariely, I think is the most accessible of all the behavioral economists. He's not only written several books that are a lot easier going than thinking fast and slow, but he's got several amazing TED Talks for people who are fans of TED Talks, and that would be that would be me. And his life story, his personal story, is also very compelling. But I guess what we want to realize is that nudging or some form of influence have always been with us. That people who were talented salespeople or charismatic leaders, they at some level already knew all the things that behavioral economists are now proving with science to say, yes, this is a good thing to do to get people to make decisions. So it's not that we can throw it out. There are some people who are very resistant to advances in technology and say, well, let's just get rid of that because all our environments do contain nudges, even if they're not being done by technology. It's not that we could get rid of that. What's the real danger that you see? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh we've always been influenced by people. And I, I like to mention Cialdini as well. It's one of the, the areas of, of research that I did in order to create the book, to write the book, was also the, the science behind persuasion and influence. So definitely, we've always been persuaded and influenced. It just turns out that behavior economists have mapped all that into um, into the cognitive biases, which we have now over 180 cognitive biases. Uh, it's a lot of those things. So I guess the difference is that some people do it intuitively and some people do it knowing that they are doing, knowing that they are. So if you're, if you go to a website right now and you're gonna travel and you wanna book a flight and you say, Automatically, the, the website says there is only one spot left on this flight. Uh, they're definitely looking at your loss aversion and scarcity. So you will be afraid of losing that one seat left. And you are also, um, the, the fact that there's only one, there is scarcity there. So those concepts like scarcity, loss aversion, um, and all those other types of, of biases that we, we get influenced all the time, they've always existed. It just turns out that we've mapped them. And uh, I love analogies. I'm gonna make an analogy here too, to kind of guide the conversation as well. The virus has existed for thousands, maybe millions or billions of years, but it's been less than 150 years since we, we've discovered like officially what a virus is, but they've always been here. And it's, uh, it's almost like those kinds of things in our brains that 
They've always been inside of us, but now they're all mapped. And because they are mapped, they can become a tool to help people, or it can become a weapon, like in the, in the book, The Weapons of Mass Destruction, uh, of math destruction, actually, which is like, they can be like data, uh, algorithms, and all the, the combination between the digital world and how humans behave can become very powerful, if in the wrong hands. Yeah. And I know that when I'm uh, preparing for thinking fast and slow or influence or picking up a book like yours, I always struggle to say to myself, why is it that we have to convince people that they are not rational? And we started this conversation by pointing that out as being so obvious, especially now that we have results from behavioral economists. But what I have to struggle to realize is that each one of us, as an individual, we believe that we are rational. We might agree that, okay, there are experiments that show how irrational other people are. And yes, that's clear. We see that. We see how irrational other people are. We can see their biases, but somehow we're able to deceive ourselves and to believe, even in the face of evidence, that no, we're rational. We make rational decisions. And furthermore, that we see reality. We see the truth. So in the United States right now, we have extreme polarization based on political ideologies. And each side believes that. Each side is influenced by their social media, the TV news they watch, and they believe they see the truth. It's not that they're saying, oh, well, I'm going to line up behind Donald Trump because even in the face of evidence to the contrary, no, they deeply believe. And that's all of us. We all believe that that we believe we're rational. We believe we see reality. And that's why these digital nudges are so dangerous because we believe that we're okay, that we make good decisions. That's so scary to me. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and one thing I wanted to bring up as well is sometimes we think that this will happen in, in the future, but it's already happening. Sometimes we feel like, oh, what, one day when artificial intelligence takes over, one day when robots become more intelligent, it's already happening. We are already consuming information. I wanted to talk a little bit about information because it is actually, I've been working on my next book and it has to do with information consumption. So the, the way we consume information, it's totally nudged. If we open a timeline right now, it could be on LinkedIn, Twitter, any, any social media, the sequence in which information will appear to us, it's completely outside of our control. So there is a concept called filter bubbles, which is if I start consuming information about one thing, I will only be fed information about that same thing, which turns out that it will confirm my my view on the thing. So I end up being inside that bubble and you mentioned the, about reality and my reality becomes my bubble and I, I stop empathizing with other people's realities and I stop understanding that uh, another type of world exists outside of my own bubble and that's very problematic as well and it's already happening right in front of us. What we also know from behavioral economics is that you can be aware you can know the science. You can look at the evidence that clearly shows that we have these biases. You've mentioned several, and there are several in your book. Confirmation bias, I think, is the worst. And that's the one you were alluding to, is once you have a belief, then you only, you will do it on your own. You will filter out any information 
to the contrary. So you can be aware of that. And yet at the same time, believe that you don't are not subject to that bias. Even graduate students or scientists who work in the field somehow believe because they know, we know these biases, that somehow that protects us. So awareness is not sufficient. After I've finished a class on influence or thinking fast and slow, I always tell my students in that class, just because you know, just because you've seen, just because you've read Fabio's book and you think that you are now acquainted with all the biases that humans suffer from them, that does not make you immune. Those are hardwired. Those have been with us for tens of thousands of years. We're not going to be able to discard those just because we have some information about them. So in a way, that's kind of discouraging. What about you, Fabio? Are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? Yeah, in terms of uh, the fact that knowing is not enough and being aware is not enough, I like to, to use an analogy a lot, which is about swimming. There is no way to learn how to swim just by reading a book, right? Only Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, that TV show, said that he learned how to swim reading two books because he doesn't need water to, to learn how to swim. So I am also, a, a, like I follow Buddhism as well. And in, Buddhist, in Buddhism, there is the concept of the practice. One thing is what's written. And the other thing is putting it in practice. My view about the biases is that knowing the biases will never make us immune, but it can help the consequences. Uh, and it has helped me and, and I have uh, testimonials from a lot of people who said that it's helped them as well. So for instance, on the one I just mentioned right now, if I'm buying something and suddenly I see that this is the last one, I just think twice. I just think with my slow brain, to refer to, uh, to Kahneman's, and then I try to think, is it really true that there's only one left, or are they using scarcity to influence me? If I didn't know anything about scarcity or loss aversion, I wouldn't even have that thought. So that's why I believe that it's not enough to make us fully immune, but it can help uh, minimize the, the consequences. And also in terms of being hopeful for the future, uh, I think there are two types of future. There is a future that will happen regardless of our actions. Um, and there are futures that will happen based on our influence. If I am an influential person and I mention something about Bitcoin, it can definitely affect the price of Bitcoin. Uh, so if I am an influential person and I mention something about digital nudging and the fact that we need policies and that we need morals and ethics behind the way that we get influenced, I believe that that can happen as well. So my, my dream is to actually create a future and help create a future with influential people like, like you, like everyone who might be listening to this. We need a movement around exactly what I call digital nudge for good. And I know I'm not alone. There are other movements in that same direction as well. Uh, Tristan Harris has a very good movement that he, he calls humane tech. He used to call it time well spent. And there's a few other thought leaders in that same area as well. I really like the movement called the Algorithmic Justice League from Joy Bulwamini. Uh, and those two movements I've mentioned right now, there are two very good documentaries that, that have been released recently. One is The Social Dilemma, and the other one is Coded Bias, that talks about uh, biased AI and how actually if we, if we create artificial intelligence with our biases, it can be even more dangerous because the decisions made by artificial intelligence can be escalated to a, to a large degree. So I am hopeful for the future because we can create it. So let's create a better future because otherwise <laughs> it can be really bad. Absolutely. I agree. And let me add to your list, 
There is an individual named Mark Hurst who is also doing what he can. I feel like many of these efforts are just kind of whistles in the wind because we're fighting an enormous, an enormous series of organizations that have a lot of power in our lives. The other suggestion from Kahneman is diversity, that it's a part of the agile precepts and the recommendation that successful organizations are built on diversity can also help with bias. Because if I include on my team people who are different from me, not just gender, but race, culture, religion, different points of view, then it's so easy for us to see the bias in others and so easy for others to see our biases. And Kahneman says he doesn't have much hope for individuals because these things are deeply hardwired, but he says organizations can develop what he calls an immune system just like an immune system response that we are all hoping to have against this virus, that an organization can develop that by having diverse teams, that these different points of view protect the organization from making bad decisions, from going down a path because they all sing the same songs and they all agree. So that's a hopeful thing for not only organizations, but communities and families. We all have contentious members of our families, and normally we don't listen to them. We get together, but we don't want to talk about difficult things, or if we do, we don't want to hear what other people say. So this is to encourage everyone, even though we don't like to do it, to really listen. That's a pattern from fearless change. Just listen. You don't have to worry about changing other people's minds or worrying about their trying to attack your points of view, but just listen with the idea of trying to learn. This is the beginner's mind that Buddhism talks about. Pretend you don't know anything. Pretend this person is wise and is teaching you and what they're explaining is how they see the world. And you won't necessarily come away from that by having convinced each other of anything. You're not logically arguing, but we've forgotten how to do that listening. We've forgotten about being humble. And if there's anything, all this information about how biased we are and how bad a lot of our decisions are, it should lead us down the road to more humility, more listening, and that's also a hopeful thing. What's amazing, Linda, is that when I listen to you, I don't have to pretend I don't know anything. It, <laughs> I just feel like there's so much I wish I could learn from you, and, uh, and I actually wanted to ask you a question. In your, in your life, how do you see the progression of technology and how do you see the level of influence? Would you agree that over time what radio used to do to people, because radio was one channel of communication, everyone listening to that one radio station and receiving the same level of information. And right now we have streaming and we have social media and we have different ways how information gets to us. How do you visualize that progression over time from, from technology and, and us? So you, you probably never had the experience of listening to radio in your family setting. But for me, when I look back on that as a child, those were some of my best memories is gathering as a family, especially on Saturday night, I grew up in Chicago, and the Sunday papers came out on Saturday night. So we were able to buy, uh, there was no subscription. You had to go to the newsstand and buy the newspapers. 
We bought the three major papers in Chicago on Saturday night, and they had the funny papers, the colored funny papers in those three newspapers. And then we would all listen to the Jack Benny show and other radio programs. But we didn't just sit there and stare at the radio. We were doing other things. We were reading the funnies. My father was reading the rest of the newspaper. My mother was doing some kind of needlework. We were all doing other things. We had the radio on in the background. So there wasn't this intense, unitary focus of all listening to the same program with the same intensity that we do now when we're staring at a movie or some kind of program on television where everybody's staring with that fixed focus. And that's what I see has increased over time as technology has entered, it has taken over our attention. Radio was in the background. My grandmother always had the radio on while she was cooking, but she wasn't focused on it. She just had music playing or the news was playing, but it was in the background and it didn't require that you had the focused attention that we now give now, when you walk into someone's kitchen, everybody's got a phone on the counter. And when the phone buzzes, when an email arrives or a text arrives, the focus shifts from whatever was going on to that phone. And the phone has interrupted the normal flow of everyday life and has said, pay attention to me. Even when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if the phone goes off, the attention shifts. And now I don't really care about the real person I might be talking to. I pay attention to this phone. The phone is the most important thing. There are people who, and I'm talking about my husband now, there are people who sleep with their phones. That's the difference, I think. Yeah, and uh, I like you mentioned attention. Like attention is our most valuable asset right now, and and it's intangible. So we don't know where we're giving our attention to. I also want to refer a very good book from a friend, uh, Nir Eyal. His his new book is called Indistractable. So I believe that being indistractable is one thing we have to um, to work on on and create that practice. And I'll be really honest with you, at this very moment, Linda, this conversation with you, it's the one most important thing happening right now. There is nothing that can distract me. I, all my notifications are completely disabled and I actually live with that. I live without the notifications because I want to be able to control my attention because it is a very valuable asset. And uh, sometimes we, we don't realize how much we are giving our attention away and look at this memorable moment I'll have for the rest of my life, this conversation with you, learning so much from, from Linda, and then I don't want to be distracted in this moment. We mentioned Daniel Kahneman's book earlier, Thinking Fast and Slow, and he points out that system two, that's our conscious attention, is limited and requires a lot of energy. And so we should use it wisely if we spend it on things that are not important to us, then at the end of the day, we wasted that valuable resource on things we don't really care about, on things that really didn't help us achieve whatever the purpose is in our lives. And for those of us who are getting closer to the end than the beginning, we know that those moments are precious. And we don't want to hand them over just because we've gotten a text message from some nonprofit organization that wants to get me very angry about something that's happening in the world right now so that I will make a donation to a cause I care about. We have to really be 
I'm going to say frugal, misers, just like money with our attention because otherwise we'll find that we're if we're profligate and wasteful, it's as though we're spending, it's even more valuable than money. This is all we have. After all, this is our life. Yes, and uh, to refer to Eckhart Tolle as well, the, the author of the book, The Power of Now, which is someone that I get a lot of inspiration from too. Like the only thing we have is the present moment because the, the future and the past are all creations of our minds and all we have is the present moment. And wherever our attention is in the present moment is where we will absolutely be. Um, yeah, so I, I'm also a huge follower of the power of now. And in fact, when I was translating the book to Portuguese, because I'm originally Brazilian and I'm partly Australian as well, I've lived in Australia for eight years. When I was translating the book to Portuguese, there is no direct translation to the word nudge in Portuguese because there is only touch and push, but nudge, which is something in between, it doesn't exist. Um, I translated the book to digital consciousness. So the, the title of the book in Portuguese is Digital Consciousness. And it, it is actually one of the, the dreams I have is to expand my digital consciousness and, um, and help people expand their digital consciousness as well, which is all about becoming more aware of how irrational we are and not allow us to be manipulated by big organizations and the digital world. So I'm wondering if we should just spend a minute on trying to be uh, positive or optimistic to say some of the good things that are happening as a result of the digital nudging, the increasing information that we have about behavioral e economics, about influencing others. And I'm sure you have lots of examples. The one that comes to mind, I read about recently that they can tell from a series of searches that people make whether or not they might have a fairly serious form of cancer. It's astounding to me that the limited amount of data that's involved in this study could point to a high incidence of this cancer. It's pancreatic cancer, by the way. And normally pancreatic cancer is not found until it has progressed beyond the point where there's much that can be done. So it's a devastating kind of cancer. And the idea that by looking at a series of searches that you could inform some individual, you should go to the doctor, you should get this checked out, it's possible. We're not saying this is not a diagnosis, but we're saying there are indications that you might have pancreatic cancer. And if you go now, you could save your own life. Now, some people might feel that's intrusive. Some people might worry about their privacy. But if it were me, and I realized this was a life-saving intervention, a life-saving digital nudge, I would welcome it. I would think this is a good thing. I agree with you. I agree that let's, let's end in a high note and, and finish with the good things about digital nudges. And the one you just made, mentioned is phenomenal. Like think about getting nudged about uh, the propensity of having cancer and being able to uh, save one life because of that. I also mentioned in the book a couple of other examples, like for instance, uh, people with diabetes right now have the ability to have their glucose being monitored continuously um, and being nudged about when to do something about it. So a friend of mine in Australia, Greg, he used to wear a uh, continuous glucose monitoring system and he said, you know what's amazing? When I'm in a meeting, I don't have to worry about because the device is making that decision for me. So artificial intelligence is always becoming better and better at diagnosing um, several types of diseases, at analyzing imaging exams 
and at getting like people's life history and, and giving advice on that. So I truly believe that the technology for good movement and the nudges for good can, can help us. It all depends on, on which hands the data will be. Because as you mentioned, your search history data can be in the hands of someone that will help you with the propensity of cancer, or it can influence someone to offer you to buy something you don't really need. Yeah. And of course, we know that this is technology created by humans. And so it will never be perfect. I like a statement that Kent Beck made years ago about Agile. He said, perfect is a verb. It's perfect. That means getting better. And we're right in the middle of, well, so many things right now. And that's our best hope. Not that things aren't, well, pretty bad right now, but we are hoping, we are hoping that because we're aware of it and because we are intelligent, even if we don't always make rational decisions, that things will get better, that we can move in that direction. In the face of climate change, in the face of a pandemic, in the face of all of the technology hurdles we face, as our best hope. And I did get that message from your book, which is one of the things I liked about it, is that we hope to get better. And the first step is awareness. So you have made us aware and you have given us hope. Thank you for that, Fabio. Thank you so much, Linda. And uh, you probably don't even know, I don't remember if I told you in 2019, but one of the people in the whole world that actually guided me in this direction of learning more about people behavior, it was you. I watched a talk that you gave in, in Brisbane, I think it was in Brisbane, yeah, uh, years and years ago when I was living in Australia. And I, like among so many people talking about technology, technology and like test-driven development, agile and all that, I saw Linda Rising talking about humans and talking about like the, the, the fact that going out for lunch and looking at trees uh, can actually change our productivity in the afternoon. Like I really remember you saying that. And so thanks, thank you so much for, for making us aware of those things too. Thank you, Fabio. It's my pleasure. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.